Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Lance J. Brown, co-founder of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to uh, our 38th event in our long-standing series of discussions with community leaders and designers around the world on our progress towards greater, greener cities for all. I'm speaking uh, uh, from upstate New York uh, with our guest today, Dr. Ivan Shimkov, who's on the Lower East Side. And it's my pleasure to introduce him and to moderate today's program. For those attending who want AIA continuing credits, education credits, you'll receive one HSW credit. We have to stay for 45 minutes. Please use the learning objectives attached uh, to the invitation and the AIA self-reporting option to receive your credits. For those joining for the first time, the organizer of the series, the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization is devoted to building bridges between the United Nations and civil society, the design professions, business, academia, and allied organizations. Our mission ranges from increasing awareness about emerging issues, facilitating knowledge transfer between and among decision makers and fostering connections cooperation and collaboration, while all at the same time promoting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and especially Goal 11 about cities and communities. Uh, in the spirit of collaboration, we want to make sure we thank all of today's program partners, specifically the UN Habitat New York office, the AIA New York chapter, the UN Habitat Professional Forum, the NGA NGO Committee on Sustainable Development, New York, Columbia University, CBIPS, and CEL, the Creative Exchange Lab. I want to invite everyone to visit the CSU website, see our resources, our publications, and join us for our upcoming 2024 events, especially our annual flagship event being held at the United Nations on October 28th. Uh, invitations can be found on the website and our Urban Thinkers Campus at the Spitzer School of Architecture at City College on November 2nd. Uh, see the website for upcoming Green Cities October and November events, uh, hopefully one with Janice Perlman. Uh, and know that our AIA New York partner has an event on September 20th that will explore re-energizing the city. Today's Green City speaker, Dr. Ivan Shimkov, is an architect, urbanist, entrepreneur, and professor. He founded the Build World um, Build Academy, organizations dedicated to providing professional solutions and education for the built environment. His companies have cultivated an industry-wide global community of professionals and organizations and supplies them with an online platform for collaboration, networking, educational, professional resources for the implementation of high impact projects worldwide. Dr. Shimkov is a licensed architect in Spain and Italy and the, direct, and the director of expansion at ELIA, the enterprise for large international architecture in Barcelona, a favorite city of mine. Ivan graduated with four master's degrees from ETSA Barcelona, the University of Florence and Harvard GSD as a Fulbright scholar as well. His rich bio online includes his many other activities and I urge you to re read it. As noted, uh, the CSU has had almost 40 uh, Green Cities programs. To date, we've had two that addressed issues of informal communities, a category we hope to expand, but I don't think any have actually discussed issues from a comparative point of view, a comparative analysis of more than one location. Today, with Ivan's rather unique experience and perspective, we'll hear about how three, we will hear about three different cities. Two we visited before at the beginning of the Green City series, but few have been about Eastern Europe. One of the primary purposes of Green Cities is to highlight best practices and to share them for all to digest. So Dr. Shumkov will share the lessons learned his work in the public, private, uh, and uh, academic sectors, 
on how to create strategies and practices for improving the built environment by making it more sustainable and resilient. And it's, it's my hope this presentation will connect dots previously unseen. On a more personal note, I've known Ivan for many years. I always appreciate the richness of his thought and knowledge about the design world. And I thank him now in advance for this generous collaboration. I know there'll be many questions. Please use the chat function to submit your questions and we will do our best to answer them all. Now, with the hope that uh, somewhere along the lines, maybe in the in the Q and A, we'll hear some about his backstory. Uh, but for the moment, Ivan, the screen is yours. Thank you, Lance, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. It's a great honor to be here as part of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization event series. I've, uh, as Lance mentioned, we've known each other for a while, and we've uh, um, informally collaborated in the past, and it's uh, it's really an extraordinary opportunity for me to be able to present uh, some of my work and ideas and some of the research that I've done uh, in this uh, in this talk. Uh, my background, as you uh, have seen or as you have heard, it's it's quite diverse, both geographically, also professionally. I've uh, uh, worked in in uh, five different continents over the last twenty years, and I've been uh, involved in the private sector in academia for many years and. Uh, four years ago, I actually worked in the public sector for about for, for about two years, and so today we're going to I'm um, I'm going to share some of my experience uh, with some of those cities and particularly the the research that uh, um, I've done in some of those cities and I'll feature some projects in those cities from a research standpoint. And then I will conclude with uh, a project which I'm currently working on, which is a technological platform uh, called uh, Build Pass or uh, Build Passport, which is essentially a platform for analyzing, assessing, uh, and improving building by regenerating existing buildings and cities or, or improving uh, buildings that are still in project phase and that are uh, still about to be completed. So with that, um, I wanted to to kind of when I think about these these three cities where I've spent uh, most of my professional uh, career and and uh, and life, um, I wanted to to see how we can compare them and and what thread I can uh, use to to kind of talk about the three of them and how they inspire each other, uh, what are the similarities between them and what are the differences between them. Uh, as we know, in the world of design, great ideas, they they flow and they, they between places and eventually they get implemented, adapted to local uh, context. And they uh, have quite a lot of impact that is tested uh, within, uh, within these different uh, cities and, and uh, countries. So um, just to, to, to tell you about why I'm talking about these three cities, I've been living in New York since uh, 2008. After I finished my master's at Harvard, I came here to, uh, to, do, uh, to complete my PhD at Columbia uh, University with uh, Professor Kenneth Frampton and uh, um, Jean-Louis Cohen at, at NYU. And later I did my postdoc at Columbia and I started teaching and working in... Uh, uh, many of the local universities like Pratt Parsons, uh, NYU, and uh, and I created also Build Academy uh, 11 years ago, which is basically uh, the, this company that provides uh, online education and solutions to people all over the world. Together with Build World, we've had more than 100,000 people participating in our uh, courses and programs and also global crowdsourcing challenges. So I wanted to start today's talk about uh, about the idea of the ideal city. Okay, so uh, and and tied to what we are doing today in contemporary cities. You know, my background, having lived in in uh, in both in Europe and here, 
um, allows me to go uh, deeper into some of that research and to see how uh, ideas have evolved and how the idea of, of cities have evolved. These are some of the sketches by Leonardo da Vinci, you know, that uh, are found from his notebooks and, and are his ideas for cities, his idea for palaces, merging different levels, using a grid, uh, intersecting and, and so on. So uh, you can find them in the, uh, the reconstruction of his uh, ideal city in the Museum of Science in, in Milan uh, when you visit it. So ever since Leonardo and the Renaissance, architects and, and visionaries have been thinking about what's the ideal cities? So what's the ideal city? And, and one of the most prominent examples of that time is the Leon Battista Alberti's uh, city, which was later to a large extent in, implemented in Turin because of its grid, because of the relationship between the public spaces, the private spaces, uh, how, how buildings have like a open uh, floor plan and lower levels and are sometimes open also on the top. I did my PhD on the work of Le Corbusier, so I spent many years uh, researching his work and uh, I had the privilege to live in his apartment in Paris for a while while I was doing the research in the Fondation Le Corbusier. I've uh, read all, all of his books and visited most of his built projects. And um, the city that we, uh, as, as he defined it, as you know, like buildings and cities were the, and, and art are, were the core of his uh, creating uh, practice. So since the 30s, he uh, started, since the 20s, he started thinking, what is the ideal city or what is the city of the future? So in 1925, he designed the city, contemporary city, uh, which was um, uh, which was an abstract city and which basically uh, had the office towers, which was a new typology at that time, the residential buildings around, and then the industry. Later, this idea evolved into the Radiant City from 1933, published as a book in 35, where we also have a separation between industry, residences, uh, cultural center, um, administration, government, and university. Okay, so um, I'm showing that to, to give you an idea of, of how dominant this idea of the grid is and how it applies into the different cities, that the three different cities that we are going to see in a bit. And also the Le Corbusier's idea of, of uh, how to operate within existing cities, you know, which is always a challenge. You know, most of the cities are built today and there with a few exceptions around the world that are places that are building new cities so most of what we do is intervention on existing cities to make them better all right so here is what he proposed in his 1937 plan for for paris uh just like Haussmann uh destroyed parts of the city to build his uh, his uh, boulevards uh, Le Corbusier destroyed to the, the, the proposed to destroy the central part of the city and to to build a new. And by the way, soon after he came to New York and he proposed the same here uh, for New York City to build a, a, a highway with a lot of towers around it. So basically, the island would pretty much look like a park with towers in it. So this idea of intervention with in an existing city with a linear element is something that he proposed multiple times afterwards. One is in uh, Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is on top sketch from Rio de Janeiro, which where basically he proposed to have this uh, continuous building going through the city. And then below this is the Kasbah uh, of, uh, of Algiers, where he had also a continuous building going through the city uh, and 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 some cur curved buildings that adapted to the typography. Later, he actually thought about the city as the unité or or a building which can contain a city uh, uh, itself. So essentially, all the essential functions of the city would be in the same building. So you know, just like the the fifteen minute city that we talk about today, uh, he proposed the something that would be even shorter it would be probably the five minute city because anything that you needed to to reach was within the same building from you know kindergarten uh, uh pharmacy uh, grocery store and so on 
his implemented project for for uh, Chandigarh uh, basically uh, had these green access that were uh, pedestrian going through the residential cities and then left only the main avenues for uh, the transportation. And the blocks were 800 by uh, um, 600 meters. A bit closer to us now, Buckminster Fuller, he uh, also thought about what would be uh, like interventions for the city. So uh, these are some of his really interesting projects now. One was to put the geodesic dome over New York and to kind of, he said that instead of heating and cooling the entire city, we can just have like a contained environment and then heat and cool all of Midtown. And that would be much more energy efficient than uh, working on the scale of a single building. And perhaps he was right. <laughs> In Montreal, he actually built a geodesic dome. And then he, at some point, he also proposed these floating cities and and here he had another idea for for a city within uh, this pyramid uh, interestingly enough he he wrote this uh, article which he published in the playboy magazine for some reason which was called the uh, the city of the future and in that case he imagined it as a pyramid which basically had the different levels and and everything was contained within a single city some of the contemporary examples of uh, uh, Master in, uh, in UAE by Norman Foster, which is uh, a way a grid city with these green axes going through the building. And then uh, the, the controversial uh, line project of a neon in, the, in Saudi Arabia, which basically also imagines <clears throat> a linear city going throughout uh, uh, the landscape and essentially having two towers and uh, open space within between them. So I'm showing these because uh, I wanted to, to stress on the idea, the examples that I'm going to show today are in terms of linear interventions within existing cities. You know, all of the three cities are uh, essentially using the linear park as a strategy, as a, as a way to intervene. I will start with New York, which is closest to us, and probably a lot of people from the audience are from here. And I'm not going to go in too much detail because you all know the examples that uh, that I'm going to show. But you know, I wanted to show them because they are inspiration for uh, the inspiration for some of the other projects in in uh, in the other cities. Um, perhaps one of the most famous and successful interventions in the city in the last. Uh, a uh, couple of decades is the High Line, which basically has uh, generated enormous impact in terms of the development of the entire uh, Chelsea area. If there wasn't the High Line, we wouldn't have the Whitney Museum, we wouldn't have Hudson Yards and everything in between them. So essentially by turning an existing uh, bridge, which was used as a railway uh, for the railway uh, and trains that would connect uh, the, the kind of the all the way from from Canal Street to Penn Station and above by turning what was left from this bridge into a park the entire neighborhood has developed and it has inspired developers and uh, and people to to actually work in this area to to create some uh, new uh, really interesting buildings and interventions that have had major impact on New York so this is the first section of, of the um, High Line that I'm showing you. This is the third section of the High Line. And then this is the Hudson Yards, which basically is on top of the um, what was the, the parking or depot for, for the trains that would uh, kind of come from, from Penn Station, which is still below on the lower level, but by building a, a platform with steel structure on top of it, they were able to build all these uh, buildings uh, uh, above it, which has become really successful uh, neighborhood, thriving neighborhood in the west side of Manhattan. So sort of Manhattan became, was very creative into, um, into generating this opportunity and into intervening uh, in a place where, into this misused space and turning into like a thriving, another thriving neighborhood for, for us in the city. A project that I worked on in partnership with a company in Beijing called Tourinscape was the competition for the Queensway, uh, which is 
similar, inspired by the High Line. It's a linear park through going through Queens again on abandoned railway tracks. Again, a linear park which is about to be uh, implemented uh, in New York or at least parts of it. You know, these are some examples of uh, of the proposal. You know, thinking about public spaces, thinking about commercial use, thinking about integrating with uh, um, uh, existing and also creating opportunities for new developments like these. Now, the, the latest project, which is uh, uh, also a linear intervention in New York, is the Big U or the park that goes around all of lower Manhattan, starting from uh, Battery Park City through Battery Park and then continuing uh, along the East River all the way to 14th Street. And this is the uh, Williamsburg Bridge on the East River, the park. Uh, the first part of the park will be completed in uh, supposedly in January of next year and in the, the rest for in the next couple of years. But linear parks and, and green interventions are, are a way to intervene in your cities. You know, here we see the uh, parts of the East Village uh, we are no longer in the time when it was possible, like in the fifties or sixties, to to have the the the, the budget and the uh, political will and power to destroy entire neighborhoods and to build new things, as as they did here. You know, I believe this was uh, Robert Moses, uh, one of Robert Moses' uh, uh, initiatives, and and Lance and others know about this better than me. Um, Another thing, another way that New York is thriving is is trying to solve its challenges and to uh, mitigate the, the 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 climate crisis that we're living in is to turn uh, roofs of buildings into green roofs. Uh, one of Le Corbusier's five points of modern architecture, interestingly, showing up hundred years ago, green roofs or solar panels. And another thing that New York is doing is to reclaim some of its uh, uh, main arteries, like, for example, Broadway, to be a public space. Now, here, cars on one side and then people doing yoga on the other side. And as you know, uh, big parts of Broadway has been uh, turned pedestrian from Columbus Circle uh, down to Union Square. Now, we're shifting gears to... Barcelona. Sorry, excuse me for a second. I'm going to close my window. <laughs> Sounds like New York. <laughs> We're shifting gears to Barcelona, uh, where I had uh, the, the pleasure to, to study and spend uh, years during my uh, early career working as an architect. And also lately during the pandemic, uh, I spent uh, two years living in Barcelona, working there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a city that I feel strongly connected to. And so I wanted to show you some examples of successful example of, of, of green cities, which is what we are talking about today. Barcelona has developed these green axes, you know, so for example, here we see what is uh, Passage de Gracia, you know, the avenue connecting the uh, the neighborhood of Gracia with, with uh, Plaza Catalunya and then the Ramblas, which is turned green, but also most recently the cities, which are like interventions from uh, all the way from the time of uh, Cerdas plan in uh, 1851, this was imagined as like a city which would have these green access. And in fact, he proposed them to go through the buildings in the middle of these city blocks. Lately, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, the city proposed, or some architects from the city proposed this idea of the super block, which was basically to combine nine blocks into one and to make it into a super block. And then all the streets in the middle would be pedestrian. Uh, it was implemented in, in parts of the city, however, it, uh, um, to some extent it was successful, uh, but it also generated some problems. So the city decided to, to shift gears and to do something else instead of the super blocks, which this is basically the idea of what a super block would be. They proposed to have something called the green axis of the city. All right. So 
you know, building on the example of of green uh, interventions, uh, for example, that already exist, like the the, the Ramblas or or uh, uh, Passage de Gracia being very green, they decided to dedicate some streets uh, that were normally used for for cars to turn them fully pedestrian. Okay, so here on the left, you see uh, these so-called green corridors uh, connecting the, the entire uh, Enchampla or the, 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 the grid city uh, designed by uh, Ildefon Serda uh, and creating uh, uh, green parks along these green uh, axes. So part of it has been implemented. This is basically the, the kind of the original idea of what would be um, the the green access wherever you see red dots. This is where they were. They have these uh, uh, hexagonal uh, octagonal squares, like the one that you see on the right. Okay, so when two of these uh, axes, the horizontal and the vertical, intersect, they make a square, a large square in between, and this is one of them. Like very very successful. Interventions very used, uh, full of people. I I lived for for two years right next to to this green corridor, and I can tell you it's incredible how many people were there every single day. And basically, it has generated enormous impact on on the entire neighborhood, on on the buildings that are near, and uh, and uh, <laughs> on the price of real estate. Uh, unfortunately, this is the what has been implemented. Uh, in the last uh, five years, so this has been recently completed. Okay, so we have the the main street Conseil de Seine, and we have three vertical streets that have been connected to it, and then basically uh, we have these squares in uh, uh, that that are kind of the intersection. So this is the first phase, and hopefully it will be continued to the rest of the city. This is what the, the intervention, these green axes look like. So imagine this was a space that was uh, occupied by cars uh, up until where the trees are. So on the left and on the right, you know, this was basically the edge of the, of the sidewalk where you have the streets and everything in the middle was occupied by cars. Well, now it's a space that has been uh, fully reclaimed by, for the people and by the people. Uh, it has bars, restaurants, a lot of uh, little uh, like uh, green interventions and little gardens, and it's extremely popular and appreciated by the people. This is one of the intersections, you know, between Eric Grandos and Conseil de Seine, you know, with a beautiful park. As you know, Barcelona has uh, incredible tradition for architecture and, and landscape design, so uh, they they did a really phenomenal work at uh, at designing and and building these spaces, and probably in the next years they would become even better because the trees are are growing really fast, so uh, the city and and these areas will be completely green, uh, just in a few years. The third city where I I uh, wanted to that I wanted to talk about is uh, Sofia. I'm I was born in Bulgaria, so I have uh, quite a connection to the country and to the city. And uh, during the pandemic in 2020, I I uh, I went back to to Sofia uh, for for two years. You know, one reason was the pandemic, uh, obviously, and the other reason is I was actually a Fulbright scholar at Harvard, so Fulbright. Um, the, the the agreement with that Fulbright scholars have is at some point in their life to return to their country of origin and to work for two years doing good things for the country. And so I thought when I went back, I thought, well, I have to do something good for the country. So, you know, uh, how can I have an impact in, in the short time that I, I could spend there on a larger scale? And I thought that, well, Maybe one way to do that is to work actually in the public sector. And so I worked for almost a year as a senior advisor to the government. And then I worked uh, with uh, the municipality of Sofia as a chief expert for architecture and urbanization. And then I was chief architect to another city close to the capital for a while. And so through that work in the public sector, I actually connected to a lot of the 
uh, European initiatives and, and I was uh, uh, working together with my colleagues on this uh, European plan for recovery and resilience, the national plan for recovery and resilience, which is part of the European initiative. So basically we, we proposed more than 50 different projects, high impact projects that uh, were supposed to make the, the city, uh, the, the, the country uh, uh, better economically, uh, uh, socially, and also uh, uh, in terms of making it more resilient and, and sustainable. I'm going to show you just a few examples of the capital of, of Sofia, uh, which is not that well known. So probably uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone has ever been there, but it's a really interesting uh, city to visit. This is actually uh, the, 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 the church. It's a Roman basilic from uh, this particular building is from 8th century, but the original one is below it. There are four different ones that uh, have been built in this place is actually from third century so uh this is and it's called uh, saint sophia and that's why the, the city was called uh, saint sophia so the city is is uh, uh, about four thousand years old so there are currently buildings in the city that are about four thousand years old and has been uh pretty much continuously inhabited uh throughout the years in, in uh, different forms. It was a really important city during the Roman times, and that's why there are some Roman temples that are uh, still present to the city, um, uh, as this one, for example, which now it's called uh, uh, the Church of St. George, but was originally uh, a Roman temple. There are thermal baths, there are amphitheaters, and, and other uh, Roman uh, monuments. So, you know, if you ever visit, the central part is full of these... Uh, Roman remains. Um, so what we see today is the city is predominantly what was uh, built um, after the, the, the liberation from the Ottoman Empire in uh, the end of the 19th century, um, 1878. And uh, so these buildings that you see here are, are pretty much like uh, pre-Second World War uh, construction. This is the center of the city with the cathedral, the National Gallery, uh, um, some of the institutional buildings like uh, the Academy of Science and the university uh, building to the right. The city has a unique relationship to the landscape around it. In fact, it's surrounded by, by beautiful mountains. And uh, those mountains um, allow uh, this like luxury that people have to have to essentially access, have incredible access to, to beautiful, pristine nature within 20 minutes of the center of the city and to be able to go skiing in the winter or, or go hiking uh, throughout the entire year. This is some of the city, uh, uh, not that pretty. Unfortunately, as, as Barcelona, this is basically built uh, um, before Second World War a lot of these buildings and right after Second World War, uh, some others, and then National Palace of Culture, this like massive building in the center, which was the largest building in the country until recently, and one of the largest buildings in, in all of Eastern Europe. Uh, this is the master plan of, of the capital. So um, you can see the kind of the, it's a concentric city. Unlike New York, which is a great city, or Barcelona, which is a, a, also a great city, uh, Sofia developed as a concentric ring city. So in the very center, you see something that was uh, all the way from the Roman times, sort of like the limits of what was were some of the Roman walls. And then the city expanded a little bit and then more and more and more and, and kind of grew through these like concentric circles, which is what uh, most cities in the world actually do. They start from a small one and then grow with circles. But that kind of uh, growth also did not allow it to have uh, an actual um, master plan, which was uh, um, uh, an actual modern master plan, all right? So essentially a lot of this is happening in, in bits and pieces, unlike New York and Barcelona, and therefore it presents a lot of challenges uh, for the city. Um, I, I worked for for the capital for for uh, almost a an year, and uh, you know one of the huge challenges is the traffic because a lot of the traffic of the city has to go through the very center of the city, 
which creates a lot of congestion. So now the cities, uh, the, the municipality is thinking how to create more of these uh, different rings or, or different uh, um, uh, highways that go around the city that allow the traffic, the transit traffic, not to go through the center of the city. Currently, a lot of the transit traffic has to go through and, and creates an enormous amount of congestion. And, uh, you know, even if the city is, is uh, relatively small compared to uh, to New York, it's, it's uh, 1.2 officially inhabitants, but uh, actually it's about a million and a half, which is exactly the size of Barcelona. Uh, it has a, a lot of a lot of challenges. And speaking of green cities, you know the strategy that the city has adopted to to create uh, uh, parks and to create public spaces is to have these like uh, green uh, parks that connect the the mountain, which is the one in the south called Vitusha, through this with the center of the city. So you have these like green spaces that kind of connect the the the, the mountain, which allows fresh air to go uh, in the city and also uh, people to eventually have views from the center of the city to, to the mountain, but also if they want to go to the mountain to be able to go through parks starting from, uh, from the center. Now, one of the latest initiatives uh, in the city that uh, I, I discovered, you know, this is, is actually before, uh, it's, it's a project before the time I, I, I worked there. So, you know, there is a, there is a group called the, uh, um, uh, the Green Line, which is very much inspired by the High Line of New York, created this idea of, cre of, of a green park around the city, which uh, connects the rivers with the parks with, uh, and uses a lot of the existing infrastructure. There was a time uh, in Sofia where this is their website, uh, Green Line uh, Sofia, if you want to learn more about it. There was a time when actually there was a, a, a railway uh, going around the city, which was using, <laughs> which was used to, to, um, to, for the industry, it was creating the, the warehouse, connecting the warehouses uh, to the main uh, um, railway tracks, which would basically go uh, um, either east, connecting to, to Plovdiv and, and all the way to, to Istanbul, Orient Express, uh, goes through through Sofia, which connects Paris with uh, with with uh, Istanbul, and so basically these uh, these like there was a ring uh, going around the city, which was later destroyed to to build the highways, and now people are now the city is trying to recuperate parts of it. Okay, so these are the existing parks in uh, in Sofia that are uh, eventually that eventually will be connected with this. Uh, uh, new intervention, the, the municipalities behind it and, and involved in it. Uh, these are some of the uh, rivers that go through the city and that uh, and, and the, the new green ring would eventually use some of those rivers as a way to, uh, to go around the city and then others will be traced around highways or, or roads or uh, area that has to be expropriated. This is the industrial areas. These are the industrial areas of the city. So as you can see, the north and the east of the city has uh, large industrial uh, areas. And with a green ring like this, you will be able to uh, go through the city and, and eventually bike through the city or walk around the city and connect the different uh, neighborhoods which I think will be fantastic if it ever happens. These are some of the ideas of the spaces where it can go through uh, either the riverbeds or around the rivers, which are currently publicly owned and some of the details of the design. This is their old railway track, which would eventually be recuperated just like in, uh, in the High Line and in Queensway in New York City. And this is the same railway that goes around the city you know here it's a bit easier because there's plenty of green open space or also the tunnels under the uh, main infrastructure the highways or railway tracks could be reused all right and these are some of the other areas that uh, will be happening or here the riverbeds which are 
publicly owned and have some parks, but were are not that well maintained. So eventually, with a, a new intervention like this, it could be uh, improved significantly, and uh, it could be a way for to bring people to give people access to green areas to give people access to to all these uh, more livable spaces that would uh, certainly improve their quality of life. So this is about Sofia, the, the project that I wanted to show you there. Uh, I'm happy later to answer any of the other questions, you know, in terms of the urban plan or in terms of the work of the municipality, uh, the major initiatives. I just wanted to, to pick one of the uh, many, many interventions that are currently done in the city and to leave the rest uh, for the questions uh, part, if you have some. Now, as I mentioned to you, when I when I went back to, to the country in 2020, I was part of the uh, team that worked on this national plan for recovery and resilience, which was actually a really interesting opportunity for me because as an architect, I, I never thought that my skills and knowledge could be applied on a country level and a continent level. You know, we always think about architecture as like designing a building, designing a park, designing a neighborhood, and maybe if we're lucky, making like a, 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 a urban intervention. But uh, I never thought about our work as something that could be applied to on a scale of a country or scale of a continent. And in fact, we do have a lot to, to contribute uh, to, to all of that. You know, we're talking about planetary urbanization. So we are all connected and we all live on the same planet. So ideally, whatever, um, whatever ideas and interventions we make have to be global. And as part of my work for the government and, and on the European Green Deal uh, projects, which is basically the European initiatives on how to, to mitigate uh, the, uh, the climate crisis, I worked on uh, solutions for decarbonizing buildings and cities. Okay, As you well know, uh, um, the, the problem globally is that 40% uh, of the CO2 emissions come from the uh, building from the, the, the building industry, uh, the use of the buildings, another 20% use also as a secondary byproduct uh, through the uh, production of materials and, and basically they're the embedded carbon uh, that is produced uh, by manufacturing steel, concrete and anything else that is used within the uh, built the construction in industry of the built environment. So currently, building owners in Europe are actually required to uh, collect the data and to present it to the government uh, in the form of something called building passport. Okay, This is a legislation that has existed since 1998, adopted by pretty much by every country in the European Union by law. Uh, and unfortunately, these building passports, which contain really valuable data, are done on paper, all right, which, you know, data on paper, it's pretty much useless because you can do, you can't do anything with it. Uh, it just stored somewhere in, in folders in boxes in, in some municipality, but uh, no one can access that data and certainly no one can analyze it and, and come up with some decisions or some strategies or certain interventions, okay. So what, what uh, uh, Europe is doing and what New York is doing, okay, uh, for those of you who are in New York, you're, I'm sure you're quite familiar with uh, New York City's Climate Mobilization Act, which is basically an initiative by, by uh, the, the, the municipality, by the mayor. And it aims to reduce 40% of the energy consumption by the year 2030 and to make buildings uh, carbon neutral by the city carbon neutral by 2050. It's a really, really lofty goal uh, for the city. Uh, I have been collaborating with some of the uh, uh, institutions here, like the, the uh, Climate Accelerator, and also speaking to people in the municipality. It's extremely difficult to, to implement this because um, you know, it forces building owners uh, to, of any building above 25,000 uh, square feet to renovate the building, which means to change the heating cooling system and eventually renovate the facade to make them uh, uh, carbon neutral. And currently there are about 50,000 buildings in New York City that fall into this category and that need to be uh, improved. Europe has something similar. 
called the European Green Deal, which commits to uh, renovate 50% of its existing buildings by the year 2050. Europe is spending uh, uh, billions of, every European country is spending billions of dollars and, and uh, um, the idea is to, to have trillions of euro as, as subsidies that are uh, dedicated to renovating existing buildings uh, between now and the year 2050. Okay, and what this is essentially forcing is to, to intervene on a large number of buildings and there is no way currently that the construction industry or even architects would be able to, to, to accomplish this with the current means and, and methods and, uh, that, that are being used. Okay, so the building owner's dilemma is to, uh, um, to, to kind of solve these challenges and to renovate buildings to make them energy efficient, but they don't have clear guidance and clear standardized processes. Okay, so um, while I was in Spain, I created this uh, company called Build Pass. The website is buildpassport.com. I created this company, which is called uh, uh, Build Pass, which essentially works on digitalizing this, uh, the, all of these building passports, okay? We're talking about life cycle data and life cycle of, uh, of buildings, okay? And there is a term that Europe uses called the digital building logbook, which essentially would collect the data of a building through the entire life, okay? As architects, we're so focused, so narrowly focused on the creation of a building but we don't really intervene that much uh, throughout the life of a building, okay? We get paid for the design of a building and then afterwards, whatever happens, happens, uh, except we hold uh, the responsibility for it. So if something happens, someone comes and sues us, okay? But with this solution, with the building passport, essentially we're able to create to collect really detailed data, okay? Like any uh, building that's that's constructed in Europe, has to create, to collect currently very detailed data about who intervenes, what materials, what construction techniques, what companies work on it and so on. So if anything goes wrong, they know later how to fix it, okay? So we collect data through the different phases, design, construction, exploitation, maintenance, change of ownership, building performance, refurbishments, demolition, and eventual recycling of building, which fits into the circular economy idea that basically we have to think holistically of the built environment. You know, the building, the, the building industry is the largest industry in the world by far. And the built environment by far is the uh, contains the the largest portion of the GDP, but also of the resources that has been uh, uh, implemented. And so with such solution, we'll be able to digitalize the data make it interactive, streamline the processes, analyze it, verify it, and make the entire process faster. So with Build Pass, which is what I've been working on for the last uh, uh, couple of years, we do assessment of that data. We do very detailed analytics currently with natural intelligence of uh, our colleagues and in the future, hopefully implementing AI because the amount of data, it's, it's really uh huge and you know to be able to process that we we do need to use technology and we create recommendations and projects on how to uh how to intervene in these projects how to make them better uh what exactly needs to happen to make them carbon neutral both for the buildings and later uh, on the scale of a city so the benefits are for all of these stakeholders in this, with the construction companies, the governments, the designers, utilities, financial institutions, and the building owners. All right. This all came because of my work with the city, because of my work as a, as a chief architect and a senior advisor, uh, because I realized that all of the work that has to happen in the city, there is no way we can implement this change on a massive scale. It would take us not 50 uh, not uh, not not like uh, 25 years until 2050, but it will take us like uh, uh, centuries to be able to to build and to renovate everything that currently needs to be uh, improved in cities. So the benefits are cutting the cost, increasing buildings value, improving residents' experience, saving time and stress for owners and 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 tenants. And also we connect uh, the, the owners with funding with these like large uh, uh, funds that are available for making things, uh, interventions. Uh, you know, with, with our solution, we uh, 
we we also integrate with beam and with ifc and the digital twins so essentially uh, our technology links to these other uh, platforms and these other technologies to and and talk to them uh, to be able to extract data or to provide certain data that is necessary in the design process and later in the uh, building main, maintenance and renovation process. The size of the problem is enormous. In Europe, there are currently 22 million residential units. In the US, it's 150 million, uh, 12 million commercial, 5 million uh, in Europe and 5 in the US. 53% of the buildings are out of code and need renovation to be brought to code. And in the US, 90% don't meet the requirements for energy efficiency. There are 2 million new buildings in, per year in Europe and 1.4 in, in the US. So our idea is to first start with the platform, connect the data and add the advanced features and then build the, essentially the marketplace where these interventions can happen and eventually create an ecosystem when all of this can be done in a much more uh, efficient way and we can um, meet the challenges of our times. The impact of, of this links to those of you who are closely related to SDGs. We work uh, closely with the uh, uh, UN SDG 11 or targeting this SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. And I believe that with these green parks and, and these green interventions were only adding a band-aid to a wound, but we are not fixing the real problem. The real problem is that there are millions of buildings out there. There are millions of, of, of interventions that need to happen and that we need to think creatively. We need to think in terms of the entire industry, in terms of governments, in terms of legislation, in terms of economics, and like all of the industry really need to, to work together to make this uh, change happen. And only by working together and only by connecting to all of those other uh, organizations and, and people in different industry, we will be able to, to create the change that we need currently on, on our planet to make it livable and, and to uh, save humanity from, from uh, possible extinction in a not so near future and to ultimately improve the life of, of our communities, which is what we are all aiming as, as, as people and as professionals. So I hope that this uh, intervention, you know, uh, inspired you for, for some uh, ideas and I'm open to collaborations. These are some of the companies that I've started uh, building, build Passport, build Academy, build World, build Tours and Harvard Architecture and Urban Society. Uh, I invite you to take a look at them. If you would like to, to get in touch with me, this is my email and, and number. And I would be open to any collaborations that you may uh, want to have. So I look forward to talking to you in the future. And I look forward to your questions now. And thank you again, Lance, for introducing me. And thank you to the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization for inviting me today. Well, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, you, you've given us an enormous amount to, to chew on. Uh, and uh, which I appreciate. Uh, it's interesting. I think you started in the beginning talking about uh, working at various scales from the global, and you did take us from the global down to the to the very detailed. And in that regard, I have a series of questions of mine, but I really like to give those in the audience uh, priority for uh, the questions they asked. And if there's time, I'll get back to mine. But while you answer the others, I'm very concerned about how we are going to educate the next generation um, to be able to engage and meet the challenge of much of what you discussed. So along those lines, starting with a question from our good uh, colleague, Catherine Klein, uh, to what extent are the residents um, of the various cities, if you got, if you can blanket that, involved in in the planning, the redesigning of their neighborhoods, and I'm very much thinking because we're in New York about how we do it here with community planning boards. Um, we're all aware of the 15-minute city, the Carlos Moreno 
uh, approach where arguably Paris seems to have gotten a handle on this. I'm not really uh, sure about how Barcelona does it, even though I'm oh, monumentally impressed with their ability to very immediately institute large plans. And I have no idea how Sophia would do it. So community engagement, can you discuss that from um, uh, an overview point of view in the different cities? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you 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 open up uh, a wound, you know, <laughs> which is the community engagement, which ideally needs to happen in uh, in every city. Uh, but uh, it's it's extremely difficult. Okay, um, I'll tell you um, about my experience in in Sofia, and basically any project has to do with by any project of of these large scale has to go through uh, public approval, okay? You can't make any kind of large intervention without the community uh, agreeing on that. However, the community, oftentimes they have a really good sense of what needs to happen, but oftentimes they don't have an idea of what of why things are better, okay? Like it, for, for us as architects and, and planners, you know, we know what makes sense, okay? But uh, oftentimes the community really doesn't know, doesn't have an, uh, uh, like the experience, doesn't have the vision why something is better than other. I'm sure even the High Line, which is now like hugely successful project in New York, I'm sure there were some people in the neighborhood back in the days that said, why would you be spending these crazy amount of money on fixing the old railway tracks, all right? And in Sofia, something similar happens. You know, there the municipality has the vision uh, to create a lot of pedestrian cities, okay, to create a lot of back lanes, to create parks. But a lot of people who live in those neighborhoods, they are, are, are actually thinking, well, we've lived all our life this way. Why do we need to change? Okay. And they're afraid of change and they're afraid of thinking, well, actually change is a good thing. It's going to improve our quality of life. Having a park in front of our house instead of a street would actually be better for us okay and a lot of people don't think that way unfortunately okay so it's extremely difficult to convince the community and in that case there have to be like a, a lot of uh, community meetings there are a lot of discussions there are a lot of like voting the municipal council has to vote it becomes like anything becomes like extremely political so even if for the smallest interventions like adding a bike lane or adding a pedestrian street it's uh it's, it's extremely challenging so in so a way I, the, the... Ivan, if i could if i could jump in um uh, i i hear your discussion about sophia and the changes and the impediment to change can you share anything you might know about how barcelona manages with relatively you know um relative speed i mean between the super blocks and now the new axes and seeing these things happen on the ground in what in new york we would be it takes a decade to do what they seem to be able to do in a year or two is, is right. this strategic in barcelona yeah so in barcelona first of all the the city is changing so quickly and 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 professionals are really trusted. Okay, so architects and 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 planners and landscape architects are trusted that whatever they do, it would make sense. Okay, so in a way, the society sees things as a good idea. Okay, and the society is used to living in a certain way, and they understand that having a pedestrian street is a is a something positive, and and it's not gonna like uh, and 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 it's something that would in, increase the 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 quality of life in in their neighborhood now in in barcelona there are obviously community presentations but uh, the municipality has a lot of power all right so the municipality has the power to to make uh imminent domain to to kind of uh to to really like take over uh properties that they consider of public use okay you may know uh josepa sevillo who is like a was the chief architect of Barcelona. So he was telling me how they built these like huge parks all over the city. They would tell people, listen, we're going to give you like better homes somewhere else if you give us your old apartment. And they destroyed literally entire like city blocks to be able to, to create this sponge like effect of the, 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 
the small urban uh, squares, okay, in a city that was like really congested and was lacking a lot of public space, okay. So you know, in in uh, in Spain, they have the money to buy people out, and they also have the power to buy people out. You know, so when they were is, this, when they were building the yeah, when they were building the railroad, he was telling me that 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 uh, uh, they were when they were they were building the ring road around the city which was huge intervention during the olympic games from from 1992 they had to expropriate thousands of private properties around the city and they only had less than 10 lawsuits of owners that did not agree to to have their uh, their their property you know paid for and 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 taken away okay so in a way you know, in, in Barcelona, somehow people seem to be getting along well, but also Barcelona has like a really powerful way of communicating their projects. Okay. They have a lot of presentations, they have a lot of like uh, publications and they really like get people on board and get people excited about the, the interventions that they're making. So I think that's the magic <laughs> in Barcelona. Thank you. I mean, a perfect, a perfectly good answer, and it's been affirmed by comments in the chat. Um, we're actually over time. Um, I there is one more question here that came in early, and I thought it was a very good question. We don't, I think, have a, too much time for the answer, but I didn't want to leave without it being addressed. And it comes from Emily Billheimer, and she wants to know in your uh, build pass how finely you drill down uh, to a level of detail to focus on all the material aspects of a building. Uh, and I know uh, this may be more easily answered by inviting or posting in the chat a website where what you actually do can be visited. Um, right. Uh, but if you can, in a in a sentence or two, say to what level of detail you go to get Emily's question on the table. Right, we go to extreme level of detail in terms of like every single product in the in the in the building. Okay, so let's say if you have a lighting system, like who made the light bulbs and who made the installation of those light bulbs. If you have a structure like who manufactured those uh, beams and columns and who installed them, okay? So we go to the level of extreme detail of how a building is uh, put together and also to extreme detail in terms of how building is supposed to be maintained, all right? So let's say in the future, if something breaks in a building, like what are the ways to fix it, you know, by their, either substituting it or by, you know, contacting the right company to do that. So I think it's a huge advantage because particularly for, you know, people change ownership so quickly in, in, in a place like New York and in other places that oftentimes you don't know anything what happened before you acquired that property. So you need to kind of do tons of research and almost like be an archaeologist of your own apartment or home to be able to understand who did what. So in that sense, we go to in like uh, as much detail as we can. That's great. Now, again, because we're over time, I'm going to take one little last privilege of the moderator. I'm going to raise some rhetorical questions. I don't cons I don't think you want to answer them. I just want to raise a series of questions that occurred to me as you were speaking, that hopefully in the series as we go forward, people can think about and respond to. One being, um, what happens to the cars? Um, I, I I'm very aware that uh, cities all over the world have decided to uh, uh, push back against the uh, capture of public terrain by the vehicle. Of course, this is a fight between pedestrians now, bikes, cars, green, kids, older people. Um, the, the one thing, the, the hard thing is what happens to the cars? Nobody nobody tells me that, and I keep asking. Um, how do, in, in the issue of attractiveness of the city, we know that Barcelona and New York are overrun with tourists. I'm very happy personally for New York. I think it's one of the sources of income. Um, I don't know if that's true in Sofia, but I think there's a big issue globally about the role of tourism in city, city design and development. Um, and the other is, of course, uh, how much is whatever we do nature-based going forward? Again, 
Those are issues that occurred to me. I don't think we need an answer. I think what we need is a big thank you and a big round of applause to you for offering us so much to think about and for being so broad in scope. So uh, for this time, until next time, to everyone who's uh, on the Zoom, uh, please join us again when, uh, when we reconvene for another Green City section. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Shumkov, for your generous um, presentation. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to continue the conversation.